case, it's on a half a page of paper. Now, in later dates when I got it, it was on a full page of of security paper. But yeah. on the back of one of these, it says, now, my name, middle and full name, etc., says, is owned by, and it has my name in caps with only the middle initial. So they gave the ownership, apparently, to the fiction of the live or now dead body. Yes, that, yes. But that's called sister K use. And in fact, if you go and look uh, at uh, some of these statutes and precedences of sister K V, that's precisely what a, a sister K use is. That the the beneficiary of the um, of the uh, title uh, is the legal fiction. That's right. Okay. Um, now, is the date of death of that original? live body. Um, is that at at the birth date or seven days later or when? Well, it varies. And in fact, I heard at some point that in Colorado they were looking to establish that that um, ownership or claiming was, was going to be done legally almost back to conception. So it, whether it's done at seven days, whether it's done one day, I think it differs depending upon which jurisdiction, which slave plantation you, you, you were born. But um, the real substance is that the birth system, the settlement certificate system, and the presumptions behind it appear universal, whether you're born in any state in America, Canada, Kenya, Australia, wherever. Well, how did the Mortmain laws then relate to that? Well, Mortmain, as I hope you, I, you may be aware, but Mortmain, as a word, was, was described as dead hand. And uh, it was expressed as a belief, well, certainly written in the history books, that the reason... Henry VIII created the concept of the statute of, of wills in the first place was that he was encountering a belligerent noble class that was siding with the church in giving their estates to the church and then effectively leasing them back from the church without paying tax. Have you heard that story before? No. Okay. Okay. Well, let me say two things about that. Well, first, let me say three things. The first is it's complete rubbish. The second is the nobles in the time of King Henry VIII did not sign wills. It is a maxim of law that he who signs a will disinherits an heir. It's a maxim of law. Nobles did not sign wills and were not required to be under the jurisdiction of the statute of wills until 1834 with the statute of wills that now define wills as wills and testament which start to incorporate the noble history of inheritance which was testamentum the continuation of the roman system so the argument that mortmain uh, existed purely on this argument of the nobles is complete and utter rubbish the sec second argument uh, is that um, Henry was sensitive to the, uh, the church. Henry had murdered tens of thousands of Catholic clergy and confiscated their land. This is indisputable. What they were hiding is the meaning of mortmain. The word was not mortmain, it was mort manus, M-O-R-T uh, manus, which means dead ghost. And it was a legal concept. And the legal concept was that a corporation and not a person can own land. Now, under Henry VIII, Mort Manus was prevented. 
you could not, under statute of uses issued by Henry VIII, allow corporations to own land. And this was all abolished in the 19th century to allow the corporations under the bankers to be introduced under the threat and the control of bankruptcy. All right, does that, does that give you some background? Yes, thank you very much. I have just one okay. quick little question, and that's like I, I live near a town that has a gazette. Okay, yep. now I under, if you publish something in this gazette, it only comes out once a week. Yep. Does the month thing still pertain, or do you have to to make it a public? No, document? it's 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 fine. What a gazette is, um, and we haven't we didn't have time tonight to talk about notice, public notice, constructive notice, and perfected notice. But there is um, you've probably heard, I hope you've heard before, the concept of a constructive notice, which is mm -hmm. perfecting the Torah procedure. Yes. 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 Okay. Perfecting the Torah procedure is an argument, yeah? It's a form of argument that if you have performed certain ritual, you can use that argument. But what the, the Roman system has done is they've tricked us to go down and, and having to run a marathon to get something perfected when all they do is publish it in an official gazette and it's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks very much. Good on you. Okay. Thanks for that. And look, um, let's see if we've got um, another question here. Um, I, I answered guest seven's questions there, so um, I'll come back to you on your next question there. Let's go to the next caller, and thanks for those questions as they're rolling out. It's uh, I see it's Ron here, so... We'll just see if we can get Ron on the call. Hello, Ron. Can you hear us? Hi, Frank. How are you? I'm fine. Now I'm echoing on my side. What's that? I said I'm echoing on my side. Ah, well, probably the streaming yep. uh, on the talk show. But can you, can you still get your question out, or do you want me to sure, call, sure. call it back? I, I just wanted to give you uh, two updates. One concerns me, and one concerns the foreclosure defense package that's up on the U of U. Yes. <clears throat> so t this morning I had a telephonic hearing with um, that federal judge in regard to releasing the attorney, okay? Yes. <laughs> and um, he accepted the notice of termination, well, it wasn't termination, uh, re revocation of power of attorney for the attorney. That's that document we worked on. And then I had to submit, I think it was Thursday or Friday, a, a real brief motion that was called, a motion to continue without direct representation of attorney, okay? So yes. between those two documents, we had a hearing this morning, and um, everything went fine. He had a lot of questions, you know, make sure I was competent, knowledgeable. I wasn't nuts or anything, right? Yes. And um, the bottom line is <clears throat> he's going to let me proceed uh, without direct representation, but I had requested that the, the attorney be retained as standby counsel. Now, I can use him to ask questions of process, right? Yes. Which is... Way better than me trying to figure it out, right? No, so, it's a very wise decision, Ron. Very wise. Yep. <clears throat> so, but in the conversation, he he got a little concerned about how long the trial would take because he had only scheduled three days. He had to get back to Portland the, the night of the the end of the trial, right? So what yep. and, and what he did was he pushed it out to November the twenty eighth for four yeah. days or five days, whatever, you know. So that's that. Now, four months ago, I received a call from a fellow by the name of Wayne Dean. He's in Sacramento, and he wanted the foreclosure defense package. By the way, he's a Eucadian member. Yeah. And he was able to change a a few little processes to make it work in California because apparently 
the California uh, recorders aren't taking the documents directly. Yeah. But if you record it on a UCC one first, and then go into the county recorder, they'll take them. Yeah. Now, they're getting wins. They're literally getting wins. They're stopping these guys in their shoes. Good. With this process that that's up on the Eucadia. Now, Wayne is also doing this for other people, or he will assist people. He's He hasn't rewritten anything. He's just put it into book form so people can follow it easier, you know? Yep. And he provides telephone support or what, whatever these people need, you know? So um, I have his email address. If people want to contact him for help, he would be glad to do that. And I'll put it up on the chat here, and then um, maybe I'll put it up on U of U. I, I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but... Well, pass it on to Gerald. I'm, I'm sure the audience who are listening now and those that will download the call later will be most interested, Ron. Right. I'm glad to hear what happened to you, and I'm glad to hear about this feedback. Can I just quickly comment on, on your matter oh, sure. for a moment? Sure. Just for the benefit of those listening, the, the, the argument is effectively by having a council directly, you effectively had uh, an agent relationship that didn't allow you to engage directly with the judge, with the, with the clerk or with the prosecutor. Yeah? Yep. And so it really limited your ability to um, uh, stand as who and what you are. You were basically being beaten into following a set of train tracks by their statute, which which, which is why, I mean, you, you, you were going to be railroaded. Yeah? Yeah, I'm going to stop a couple times. But... So, you there, Ron? Yes, I am. I'm listening, Frank. Yeah. So I think now what will happen is that once you've freed that up for people and the wisdom that you've done, you've now got some more latitude in terms of seeing what administratively you can prepare prior to trial, yeah? Right. Now, the one the one kicker, and I did not protest when he said it, yep. but, you know, you're on the phone, what do you, you know, I, I might do it in paper, but he insisted that who submitted the motion was not the executor, but the defendant, okay? but So I have to go back and I have to fix that. That's all right. That's okay. Right. That's all right. Look, I mean, the, 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 my last comment, and, and because we've got people who wanted to talk, we know we're going to get through some of these questions, but this is all relevant for different people for different things, and it's obviously relevant for you. The, the key point, Ron, is you are behaving in a mature manner. You're behaving in a respectful manner, even though they have done terrible things to you. And if you behave that way, then whether they like it or not, you are actually behaving as a general executor, aren't you? Yes, I am. And I think that is the ultimate, that is the ultimate, ultimate thing that I think will carry you through, Ron, is that you, in your knowledge and your competence, and especially in your behaviour, are behaving in a manner that can have a resolution brought forward. Yeah? Right. Look, thanks for sharing both of those, Ron. And uh, if you've got anything else, come back on. But look, thanks again for everything you're doing. I know many people appreciate it, and I do. Thank you. You're welcome. See ya. Bye. Cheers. Um, okay, let's go to the next caller, and then we'll go back to the, uh, the questions on the chat. Uh, I'm trying to mute. Shanbo, can you hear us? Hi, Frank. Hi, how are you going? Uh, pretty good. Uh, this is Bob. Uh, I was just curious. I had a few questions. We were talking about public and private law. Uh, it's my understanding you can't mix public and private? No. So my question, the sense here, is can you bring public record into a private court? Yes. It's, um, it's the... One of the 12 presumptions we, we say is that the private bar guild is, is operating business, their private business in public buildings. 
So right. when you go to a courthouse, the presumption that we all make, and I've made this, is you see a stenographer, you see...